13 seconds doesn't sound like a lot, but every 13 seconds, a poison control center in this country answers a call about someone being in trouble. California's poison control system is the largest in the country, and it's gearing up for the start of National Poison Prevention Week, which starts on Sunday. To that end, I'm live with the assistant medical director of our state system, Dr. Sai Rangan. Good morning to you, doctor. Morning. Thank you for having me. Definitely. Thank you for being here. Now, when you think about a poisoning, most people, I think, would imagine something being maybe mislabeled or not labeled that you swallowed by mistake. But most rattlesnake bites happen in California between April and October, according to the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, or almost to April. And snake bites count as a poisoning, too, right? Absolutely. So snake bites are basically a natural poison uh, that uh, can occur in the months that you mentioned, but we even see some bites in the months of December and January. Snakes are out and about all year long, uh, but the majority of them do happen in those months that you mentioned, April to September. Now, your agency is launching a new video on Facebook about the whole rattlesnake issue. You know, I have to confess, they're not my favorite creature. Why so important that families grow their awareness of snake bites, spider bites, the whole range of poisonings? Well, it's important for us to realize that when we live in areas that are near snakes, we are in the snake's backyard. It's not that the snakes are in our backyard. So we are infringing upon their homes and their territory. In general, rattlesnakes are actually fairly defensive creatures. They're not going to go out and try to find you and try to attack people. But if you get too close, snakes will be defensive and they will defend themselves by striking out at you. And when you do get bitten by a rattlesnake, uh, that can be a... Uh, a very serious medical matter and you need to get to the hospital as soon as possible and then we at poison control can help the healthcare official who's taking care of you uh, make sure that you have a good outcome the latest stats show that more than 250,000 calls are made in a given year for help and information about poisoning again national poison prevention week starts this sunday what are the top ways that we can avoid some of these problems because i feel like on the rattlesnake issue that's kind of hard to get around aside from just like staying home and not getting you know in their backyard as you just said well, it doesn't mean that we can't go outside. And obviously, as the the weather starts to warm, hopefully in the next uh, in the next several weeks, we'll we have outdoor recreation that people want to partake in. And what's uh, important is that people take reasonable and 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 routine steps to ensure that they prevent a rattlesnake bite from occurring. So, in other words, when you're going hiking, try to stay on the paths. Don't go into the brush and into dry areas where snakes may be hiding. Uh, if you're out in parks, uh, notify park rangers if you do happen to see a rattlesnake. Don't try to take care of a situation like that yourself. Never approach a snake and try to pick it up or try to move it with a stick or something like that. Make sure that professionals are going to be around to do that sort of work. And if you take those kinds of precautionary measures, in addition to wearing long pants and wearing appropriate shoes, then we can hopefully prevent these bites from occurring in the first place. Your agency, the California Poison Control System, issued a warning back in January about all the heavy rain that we were having, spawning a bumper crop of wild poison mushrooms. We've had heavy rain at the end of last week, the beginning of this week. And look what showed up on my lawn just this week. Are you only in trouble with some of these mushrooms if somehow you eat them or could just touching them, like trying to remove them, get you into trouble? That's a great question. As we all know, there are edible mushrooms and there are non-edible mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And the edible ones are the what we what we buy in the store. Uh, the non-edible ones are the ones that grow in the wild and the ones that we shouldn't be picking ourselves and, and touching ourselves. Uh, I would recommend that unless you are an expert in the field of botany or mycology, that you should never pick wild mushrooms and eat them on your own. Uh, anything that might be growing on your lawn could have uh, potential toxicity that may include uh, nausea and vomiting and diarrhea, but some mushrooms can be so poisonous that they cause neurologic toxicities mm. such as seizures or even liver failure. And so we have these kinds of poisonous mushrooms all over the United States of America. And so it's very important that if you do see mushrooms in the wild, that you don't eat them intentionally and make sure that we're supervising our children and our pets uh, not to eat them accidentally. Okay. So we just need to plow these over if, with the lawnmower and then remove the bags. Exactly. Just just make sure that they're they're out of reach, out of sight, out of mind uh, for anyone who might be near them. 
All righty. Well, I was just talking about that potential threat that showed up at my house. About 80% of all calls to the CPCS are made from home, and nearly half of those calls involve children under the age of five. I want to know, what's the biggest thing that we need to watch out for with the kiddos? And while you answer, we're going to put up the number that someone might need to dial if they think they're dealing with a poisoning. It's 1-800-222-1222. Um, so what is the biggest thing we need to watch out for with the kids? Well, what's so important about uh, young children is that when you're looking at young children, especially toddlers, uh, they love to explore around the house. They also like to take objects and put them in their mouths. So when they get a hold of, let's say, a bottle of pills, which might have a very attractive sound when they start to shake it, uh, they may open that bottle of pills and take one of those pills that's inside. Um, if people have uh, pill dispensers, sometimes those are a little bit easier to open than child-resistant containers, and children may have access to those. It doesn't take very long. It only takes a a few seconds for a child potentially to get into one of those pills and swallow them and potentially create a poisoning emergency in your home. So proper su supervision, of course, is very important, but we can't be supervising our kids every second of the day. So to make sure that we try to prevent these poisonings, keep things out of reach, out of sight, out of mind. If you have pills, especially prescription pills, make sure that they are locked up. Make sure that the children do not have access to those in any way to make sure we prevent these poisonings from happening in the first place. There are a number of pills out there, especially anti-blood pressure medications or anti-seizure medications. These have the potential to, to cause a death in a toddler. Uh, who's maybe less than two years old with just one pill. So it's uh, it's sort of akin to the idea of keeping a loaded gun around the house. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't keep a loaded gun around the house in front of a child. We also shouldn't keep pills that potentially could harm a child with one pill around the house with easy access. Very important message leaning into the start of National Poison Prevention Week. Thank you so much, doctor, for joining us today. Anytime. Thank you very much.